dabbling in the occult, stories of religion. He's conducted seminars. He's had his own radio show. He's all over the map. With great pleasure, let me introduce Jordan Maxwell. I want to again thank George for being here. Because many nights when I was under pressure and, and was legitimately afraid for my life, uh, you know, to get a phone call from George or Tom just to see how you're doing was very reassuring to me. Um, I've, I've been under a lot of uh, pressure and I have heart trouble and I've had medical problems too because this particular lifestyle that I have lived for the past 48 years has taken its toll on me. Um, you cannot, the, the universe is very interesting the way it works. Uh, the way, and I'm using this as a metaphor, but the way God works, if you want to do something and it's very important to you if, you, if you go out and put your whole self into whatever it is you want to do, you very well might be able to accomplish it. But if you do accomplish your goal, you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay a price. For me, I lost my wife. I lost my family. I've had everything I own in this world stolen from me three times. My offices were burglarized, stolen, and took everything I own. And my so I and of course then I get phone calls from FBI, phone calls from federal agents, uh, warning me to keep your mouth shut. Uh, and, and that kind of stuff is not, not the kind of thing I want to live with because today in America with 9-11 happening and the overthrow of the United States of America with a coup d'etat, which is what has happened. America is no longer the, free, the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave. We're now slaves under a totalitarian fascist regime. And the people all around the world know that the great Republic of America is now on its knees and is in the process of being destroyed. And the reason why is because you cannot have a new world order under fascist world do domination when the biggest guy on the block is still the boss in his own home. So in order to destroy the United States, you have to destroy the people, its institutions, and this is what we have now come to finally realize in America that America is on its last and final days and very soon you're going to see I believe you're going to see the full ramifications of the people who are behind world government and what they're going to do to America they have something planned for us that you don't want to know they've got concentration camps already set up for Americans they have uh, <clears throat> an agenda. And part of what I wanted to talk about tonight um, is dealing with that. I have two presentations to do tonight if we have time. One is kind of on the light side, uh, dealing with religion. Because I believe that religion is at the bottom of all of the world's problems. Because the people who are in power have given us our governments, our legislatures, our laws, our institutions of higher learning, they've also given us our uh, governmental systems and they've given us all our religions. Religions come from the same people who have given you your banking system, your governmental systems, so that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are nothing more than Masonic concoctions to entertain the masses, to entertain the people and keep them occupied. And this is, of course, what George Carlin was talking about when he said it's a big club and you ain't in it. Because the, the religions of this world are designed purposely to distract your mind and to give you something to hope for. While the people who came up with these ideas in England uh, know what they're doing. They are subverting the human race. What we're seeing today is the human family on the earth is being mutated. Um, 
The reason why we have major wars in the world. All kinds of people have all kinds of ideas about why we have different wars and what, what all of these wars are all about. Wars are for one reason only, and that is to guide the human race. To, to guide the human race into a particular realm of thinking. Because if you have peace around the earth, everybody would get together and do things together, but, but that's not what the masters who own us, who think that they own us, want. So they create wars, which then feeds violence, it feeds pornography, it feeds uh, all kinds of debasement in the human being, and therefore they're dropping down and mutating the human family and rebuilding us through video games and through television propaganda, etc. So it's a very, very serious thing which is now facing the earth. And most of the people in the world today have no idea in the world what's going on and how this stuff really works. Uh, I, was, I was fascinated to um, learn how government works. One of the nice things about my life is that I've been able to meet a lot of very interesting people. And when I discovered how government really works, I was amazed at how commerce, government, religion, uh, all work together and everything is, is well planned out and so until and unless the people of America and the people of the world awaken to how this stuff really works, we are a doomed species because they, we're being fed propaganda and lies and mis, mis, uh, mistruths and it's, it's very frightening because I know where we're being led. So I wanted to talk tonight about um, religion and government and, um, you know, Moses was the great lawgiver, we're told. When you find out that, and it won't take very long if you start doing some research on your own, you'll find out that Christianity and Judaism and Islam, the three of those, those three religions are referred to as the people of the book because all three rely on a book for their religious teachings. The Quran, the Bible, and the New Testament. All I believe the New Testament is a metaphor, and I'm going to give some lectures on that later, but um, Judaism today is actually Hinduism. It's connected through the ancient Hindus, many of their teachings called Brahmanism. And you put an A in front of Brahma, it becomes Abrahma, or Abraham. And so this whole religious thing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of this stuff is Hinduism. And when you find out how the uh, old ancient Phoenician Canaanites were the, were the bankers, the pol politicians in the Middle East, they picked up on the old Hindu stuff and a lot of the teachings coming out of Egypt and fashioned a new religion called Judaism. And out of Judaism comes Christianity. So, and so much of Christianity and Judaism is based on the Old Testament and Moses in particular. Moses and Abraham were two very big names in the old Jewish tradition. And so when you begin to look at the history of the scriptures and the history of the Old and New Testament, uh, you will begin to see for the first time that the stories in the Old Testament um, have been misrepresented. And Two of the most famous archaeologists in all of Israel today, uh, the top two archaeologists in Israel today, have written a book called Unearthing the Bible. And in it, they, they said that none of the stories in the Old Testament are actual historical facts. And that, in fact, in point of fact, uh, there was no ancient Israel, there was no ancient Israel, so all of this uh, talk about the ancient people of Israel, there was no ancient Israel. It didn't exist. There were Canaanites. And in the Bible we hear about the Canaanites, but the Canaanites were the people that we today call the Hebrew people. So Canaanite religion is today referred to as Judaism. Yes? All I do is just say, to go forward, right here. So, so forward like this, and then back like this if you want to go back. Right. She's going to read off the line. You can't see anything on here, unfortunately. It turns off. Say it again. 
You can't see anything on here. It turns off, so you don't have to look at the to see what in. Oh. Yeah, but okay. this is all you do is just to go forward, like that. Yeah. And then backwards. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's going to be a, a bit of a disappointment because uh, I'm not going. Maybe I can turn this around then, so I can see it. I guess that's about as good as we can do. Okay. That's your forward, and this is your backwards. Right. Okay. Good deal. I think so. Okay. Moses is the basis for the law, and in America, that's what we are. You know, we've been told so often that that. Um, America is a land of laws. We are a nation ruled by law. Well, in point of fact, that's not true. America is not a nation of laws. America is probably the most lawless nation on the earth. America's laws are decided each day by those who are in power. And whatever they say the law is today, that's what the law is. And if they say it's different tomorrow, that's what the law is. So there is no law in America. America is a lawless nation. And we are heading into a lawless time in the world where only violence and revolution and bloodshed is going to settle anything because there are no laws. And, but um, I think it's interesting for both Jews, Christians, and Islam to realize something about Moses and the law. So he's the lawgiver. And we're told that he was given the law from God. He comes down from the mountain. Incidentally, Moses throws the law down and breaks it, so he was the first lawbreaker. <laughs> and um, the Ten Commandments that we are supposedly were on those, on those uh, tablets, the Ten Commandments were copied from something in Egypt called the Twelve Negative Confessions called Twelve Negative Confessions. You can look it up in any encyclopedia on Egyptology, on Egypt, and you will see that the Twelve Negative Confessions were, trans were, were transposed <clears throat> and became known as the Ten Commandments. So the very Ten Commandments were Egyptian. Uh, that's just some scriptures showing the, uh, the connection between the ancient book of the dead of Egypt and the Exodus. And here's Moses with the Ten Commandments. Moses the lawgiver. Now, even in the government, there are, even in the U.S. government, there are statues of uh, Moses and the um, halls of justice and even in the House of Representatives in America, you have Moses. I think it's interesting that this picture of Moses has the Roman reef because America's government is Roman. The three cornerstones or the three legs on which America exists is, first of all, Roman in government, Greek in philosophy, and Jewish in law. So Jewish law with Greek philosophy and Roman governmental system is the way America operates, Rome, Greece, and, and, Jew, and the Jewish law. <clears throat> but why does Moses have horns? Most people have never noticed that in almost all the carvings, Moses has horns. Yeah. Moses is pictured with horns because the horns are representing the moon. Moses was the focal figure of an ancient cult of moon worship on the, on the Sinai Peninsula. The horns represent the crescent moon. So when we see the horns are actually the moon in the lower quarter. Here is the moon god. Um, in Sinai, well, I guess I'm going to show that anyway, so I'll wait. You'll see the horns of the moon in Rome. Now, Native American Indian chiefs wore horns. The Vikings, one, uh, Native Americans and the Vikings wore horns. Uh, because the Native Americans always counted their days from sundown to sundown. So they, you, know, you would hear the Indian, American Indians talk about many moons have passed. They didn't, they didn't keep track of the day by the sun because that was Christian, sun worship. 
So the Native Americans, like the uh, uh, Vikings, uh, were moon worshipers. So they, they counted their day from sundown to sundown, just as the Jews do today, from sundown to sundown, because that's when the moon comes out. So the horns were the horns of the lunar horns of the moon. And uh, a lot of the old coins and, and, um, and carvings in the ancient world show the hands raised as they were worshiping the moon god. In Egypt, and of course in Islam, Islamic religion uh, is a very interesting combination of moon worship and Saturn worship and Venus worship. Venus is very big uh, in, the, in the Islamic religion. Here it is in the Vatican. You'll see the, the crescent moon. So the moon cult. Oh, and I was just showing that if you go to Google and put in moon god sin, because the name of the moon god in, 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 uh, in Arabia was his name was called Sin. And so if you look up the word Sin, or Allah, it will tell you that Allah in Islam is actually the, the moon god Sin, S-I-N. And A-I in the ancient uh, language was a, was a mountain. So Sin, A-I, is the god of the moon god, comes up over the mountain. So put it together, it becomes Sinai, Sin, A-I. Even in the Catholic Church, they have the crescent moon. Now. The moon god, as I said, was named Sin. And it shows here that uh, this is just from an encyclopedia. Sin, the moon god, was chiefly uh, venerated in pre-Christian civilization in southern Arabia. If Moses climbed Mount Sinai to meet the resident god, then the god he met there would have been the moon god Sin, who had been enthroned on that mountain since the rise of Samaria. Uh, Sin gave his name to the whole Sinai Peninsula. So the moon god's name was Sin. And moon worship has been big all over the Middle East. And you'll see moon god virtually everywhere in the Middle East. And then we get to this article, points out that the original Yahweh was only another form of this primitive lunar deity of Arabia. So Yahweh of the Hebrew religion was actually Sin, Ai. And this is why, in, in, even in Israel today, they, don't, they do not spell synagogue, S-Y-N. In Israel, they spell it S-I-N. Because synagogue was the house of worship of the god Sin. Sin, Agog. And here in, uh, in Israel, you'll see another synagogue and blow it up, and it's S-I-N. So synagogue comes from the early worship of the moon god Sin. Um, just showing how, uh, you know, in, in, in Jewish literature everywhere, it talks about the moon, uh, many moons, most the Jewish cycle of the moon. And so the point I'm making here is it's very important to realize that Moses represented a moon cult. And this is just the first part of, uh, and you'll see here on the Sinai Peninsula, Mount Sinai, and it's across uh, uh, from Egypt, and that's where the great mountain range was in the middle of Sinai, and at night when the moon would come up in the east, there was a mountain range there. And the moon god's name was Sin, and the mountain was Ai, put it together and become Mount Sinai. It was called the Mountain of Moses, or the Wilderness of Sin. So, Sinai was the worship of, and I'm just showing, uh, if you go to Google, they've got Moses and moon worship. Got thousands and thousands of articles about this subject, so. It's up to anybody just to do your own research. Now, Moses was also connected to a volcano cult also. So you got the moon, and now you have volcanoes. 
Volcano worship was very big in, uh, in the ancient world. Hmm. It says, volcanoes, like any other impressive or fearful aspect of nature, volcanoes have been the object of worship for human beings from the earliest Stone Age. And yet, original Yahweh seems to have begun as a volcano god also. Mount Sinai, where Moses encountered him, was the seat of the Midianite god who had formerly dwelt in a volcano. So this is why in all the uh, drawings and pictures in the Jewish religion, you will always see Moses encountering Yahweh at the volcano because, uh, because the ancient Canaanites, Phoenicians and Canaanites and people of the Middle East also worshiped the god of the volcano. Even books show, uh, even books put out on the subject of Mount Sinai show it in burning and flames, mountain of fire. Um, As you turn, it keeps coming in and out. I don't know if that'll help. Let's see. We'll try it. Anyway, and so here we have uh, Moses. Now these pictures are taken from uh, Jewish uh, publications for children in, in, in the synagogue. You'll see Moses here. Does that look like a volcano to you? Yep. Yeah. Here's another one, Mount Sinai. Jehovah performs signs for the Israelites. That looks like a volcano. There's the children of Israel. That's another thing that's always interested me, uh, how in Israel we have the children of Israel, but you have kids, which are baby goats. Uh, <coughs> Here's another picture of the volcano with the Israelites. So, and, and, you know, it's very, it's everywhere. All you have to do is look at any of the publications of the Jewish religion and you will see volcanoes, moon worship. <laughs> Here's one Israelite telling the other one, no, that's a volcano, airhead. See? Yeah. Here's Moses up in the volcano. Here it says, uh, one day the mountain rumbled and it spewed out fire and smoke. The mountain was engulfed in dense cloud. God called out of the cloud. There's the Israelites running from Mount Sinai. Looks like a volcano. And here's a mountain named Sinai. And does that look like a volcano? Now here in, uh, in the Encyclopedia Judica, there was... Um, page showing some of the symbols for the different feast days. And the feast day at the bottom was the feast of the giving of the law. This is from the Encyclopedia Judica. Here's the feast day of the giving of the law. Does that look like a volcano to you? Yeah. Because the Jews were worshipers of a volcano god, worshipers of a moon god, they were worshipers of the planet Saturn. Saturn was called Lord of the Rings because Saturn was God of the Rings. And they're still making movies in Hollywood today, Lord of the Rings. And most people going to movies have no idea in the world that Lord of the Rings is the planet Saturn, and Saturn was the God of the Hebrews, or another name for Saturn was Yahweh. Yahweh, or Yahweh, Jehovah, Saturn, Lord of the Rings. This is why uh, women were told to listen to their God so they would wear an ear ring. Men were to listen, to get married before their God so they wear a wedding ring because the rings represent the planet Saturn. We can get into all of that when I get into courts and, and government later. So um, <clears> there <throat> it is, the feast of the giving of the law to Moses, a volcano. The volcano comes from, the word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan or Vulcanus, derived from the old Christian deity Vulcanus. My dear friend here, Abin Ray, was going to do the reading but as long as I, um, I feel, you know, as long as I got the energy, I'll do it then. <laughs> uh, so here's volcano. The word volcano comes from a Latin volcano god Vulcan. There's Vulcan, beautiful picture. Uh, Prometheus was a volcano god whose worshipers took him to Greece. Yahweh was a volcano god whose worshipers took him to Judah. So. Tribes living on the slopes or the fallout area of an active volcano uh, promoted their smoking home to the status of tribal goddess. Regularly uh, captured enemies and threw, it into the threw them into the volcano. Yahweh, whose worshipers were the Jews, Vulcan, later 
when the Jews became patriarchal, the Mount Yahweh, which was female, became Mount Yahweh, dropping the feminine ending. So the original Yahweh seems to have begun as a volcano god on Sinai. So here's um, God. You'll see he's raised on the mountain. This is God chiseling the, the, the law of Moses. And you'll see the mountains on fire. You'll see the, the lightning behind God, uh, which is the same lightning and fire of uh, Volcanus. He was also uh, identified with the local moon god Sin, after whom the mountain was named. Uh, the appearance of Yahweh as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night certainly suggests a volcano spirit. And in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, it says, Then the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by. So uh, he took not away the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So we're told in the old Hebrew scriptures that that God appeared to the old ancient uh, Israelites as a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day so that they would know Jehovah that was there with them. Well, that's what you get with a volcano is a pillar of, of uh, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So these are just uh, quotes from uh, reference works, encyclopedias about, uh, and I won't, uh, since we have so much more, I got it cram in there, we won't go through all these scriptures, but the bottom line is, is that there's just an awful lot of um, documentation, books um, that you can go to to check all of this out. It's, it's everywhere. But most people don't do this kind of uh, tedious research, spending months and months in, in UCLA libraries and USC and, and Berkeley and, you know, for weeks on end Day in, day in and day out now for 48 years. Most people, uh, you know, Jordan. got more important things to do. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I would spend days and days and days, sometimes weeks on end, at just on one subject at UCLA. And, you know, they have like a seven-story um, uh, library above ground and three stories below. I'd spend weeks and weeks just photocopying documents, talking to rabbis. I used to go down to the Simon Wiesenthal Center for Holocaust Studies and sit there for hours and talk with the rabbis. And one of my dearest friends was Rabbi Marvin Antelman from Newton, Massachusetts. Rabbi Martin Antelman was a very, very kind and loving man. He was a very dear man, he was a very dear friend. And at the time, he was a president of the American, something called the American Rabbinical Association. So he was a very highly placed rabbi. And this was back in the early 60s. And Rabbi Antelman and I used to sit and talk about religion, philosophy, governments, war, and the whole state, what we call, we call Israel. You'd be surprised at the stuff that the rabbis actually know. They're not telling you. I asked Rabbi Antelman one time, I said, <coughs> I said, Rabbi, tell me the truth. Was there, in fact, in point of fact, uh, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or Moses, or King David, or any, any of those people, uh, you know, did those people actually really exist? And his response was something to the order of, uh, look at, everybody has a religion. The Catholics have got a religion. Muslims got a religion. You know, Buddhists got a religion. We got to have something too, but we got a religion. And so I said, yeah, but were these people real? He, and so he said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is actually Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. From Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, you've got Osiris, Isis, Horus, or uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. There's always, always must be a triune God. It's always a tr three, three gods in one. So therefore, the Jews can't have anything to do with Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, so they have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob which gives us Judaism. No, there's just three names of three divine principles. So the whole thing is based on the, on the triune gods. But here in the scriptures in Job 36 in the Old Testament, it says, the noise thereof showeth concerning it, the catalog concerned, the vapor, the noise, 
therefore telling concern the storm that is to come. These are just scriptures talking about, um, like down here on the bottom on uh, Job 37, 2 says, Hear attentively the voice, the noise of his voice, and the sound that goes out of his mouth. We come to find out that he direct it under the whole heavens and his lightning to the ends of the earth. And after it, the voice roared, he thundered with his voice of his excellency. So even in the Old Testament, it's talking about God thundering with his lightning and his thunder. And um, God, on the bottom of here, on page 960, it talks in the scripture says, God thunders marvelously with his voice. So we're talking about a God of thunder, the God of the, uh, of the volcano. And so, uh, <clears throat> oh, here's another one. In Job 38, talks about the storm, the clouds, God's tent gathers as the thunder, the voice of Yahweh roars. They descend and God shoots the arrows of his lightning. So the storm, the clouds, and God's tent gathers as the thunder, which is the voice of Yahweh. So you've got a cult that's uh, you know, hearing thunder, and that's God speaking. <clears throat> and of course, if you look up the word God in a Latin dictionary, look up the word God in Latin, it's Deus, D-E-U-S, I think it's spelled, D-E-U-S, Deus, <clears throat> and Deus, it will tell you in a Latin dictionary, comes directly from the word Zeus in Greek. So when you hear Christians or Jews talking about God, the word in Latin is Deus or Zeus. <clears throat> Zeus was the god of lightning and thunder. So when you hear the, you know, Christians talking about God, just know that what you're talking about, let's go back to the Catholic Church, go back to Rome, and go back to the word in Latin for God, which is Deus, which goes, comes directly from Zeus, the god of lightning and thunder. I don't want to tell Christians that too much, and you know, this is why I don't talk about this kind of thing on George Norrie's show, because I, people are not ready for the truth. I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you an interesting <coughs> piece of information. Oh, thank you. I'll give you an interesting piece of information. Um, I've learned this the hard way, but people will always support what they want to hear. They will not support what they don't want to hear. So if you like country western music, you're not going to pay $40 for a rap concert. <laughs> right? <laughs> so people will always uh, support financially in every other way what they want to hear. They will not support what they don't want to hear. And the one thing around the world, generally speaking, that people do not want to hear is the truth. That's the one thing they don't want to hear. They would much rather hear goofballs on television, like on TBN, dancing around with their little effeminate haircuts and their diamond rings, falling on the stage, spitting on each other, falling back on the stage, and doing all of these uh, silly things that are a mockery to human race. But people will pay big money because it makes them feel good. Because the Lord, which is spelled L-A-R-D in the English dictionary, uh, yeah, look up the word L-O-R-D in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. It's a huge voluminous set of books called the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. It's an incredible uh, uh, set to have. And it's every word that's ever been used in English and where that word comes from. And it's got like a page or two on every single word, where it came from, what it meant, how it's evolved over the centuries. And in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language, it will tell you that, um, you know, all of these things I've been telling you. Zeus is God, and um, Dios is, is Zeus. Um, God, I'm trying to think of some other really interesting stuff there, on, on, especially on Saturn. Go to the Oxford Dictionary, look up Saturn, it will give you all the information on how Saturn was the basis for Judaism after it, uh, after it took from everything for, it could from, from uh, India, from the Hindus, they then, imp then they began to uh, bring in Saturn worship and then the moon worship of sin, which gives us cyanide, to incredible stuff. <clears throat> 
Oh, here it is. You know, God in English. Uh, translation is a Latin word, Dios. The spelling is Zeus. But Christians, uh, I have found, want to, as I said, people generally speaking don't want to hear the truth. They would much rather pay a lot of money to hear what they want to hear. <coughs> and I felt, I have always felt that the times we're living in is so critical and so frightening that um, I would think people would want to know the real truth about what's going on. Who's really running this government? Who's really running world governments? And where's the whole human race going? Where are we all going? We're being led somewhere, and we haven't even the faintest idea what the words mean, what the symbols mean. We're just trusting in our, in our leaders, and the leaders are not leaders, they're misleaders. So there's the volcano cult with the lightning and the thunder. The scriptures even says, in the Bible it says, and after it the voice roared, he thundered with his voice. So, so much for Moses uh, and the volcano. So now we know Moses was connected to the moon worship in Sinai. He was also connected to the volcano worship. And one more point about Moses and Vulcan, the volcano god. Vulcan, the volcano god, Mr. Spock, was a Vulcan, right? And the reason why that hand signal, that hand sign, is Hindu. It goes back to an ancient concept in, in the ancient Hindu religion. Now, in the Bible, um, a lot of books on the Bible will show you the, that hand sign is actually called the benediction symbol. The rabbis, when blessing the congregation, the Pope does the sign of the cross when he's blessing. But in, in, the, Hind, uh, but in the Hebrew uh, synagogues, the, the rabbi will bless the congregation with the, the blessing. It's called the benediction symbol. He blesses the congregation. <clears throat> Here you will see the Pentateuch crown with the hands raised in a priestly blessing. Here, indeed, the Lord is high, yet he looks upon the low, lowly. You know, and that's another point I'm going to make here in a few minutes about why they call God the Most High and why the Lord is the Most High. There's a reason why. Here in the uh, <clears throat> synagogue in downtown Los Angeles, you will see the uh, rabbi giving the benediction symbol. So you'll find it everywhere. Here is a rabbi blessing the congregation. So this is a uh, benediction symbol of Vulcan, the volcano god. But where does this hand sign come from? It goes back to the goat god, the split hoof of a goat. So now we get into the old ancient goat god uh, worship, Baphomet of the Freemasons call it Baphomet, but it's the worship of the goat and then, of course, once you get into the deepness of the deep theology of Hinduism, uh, which I have well, I've been shown some really interesting material on that too, <clears throat> I'm going to put it on my website soon, showing you how the Hindus use the symbol of the goat's hoof. And so when you see the rabbi is giving the rabbinical blessing, just remember it's connected to the goat god. goat worship. Incidentally, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's very important. The, the Star of David, <clears throat> the Star of David is a six-pointed hexagram. And the hexagram was a symbol for, if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Encyclopedia Americana, any great in reference works of encyclopedias, and look up Star of David, it will tell you what Star of David is actually a hexagram which was the original astronomical symbol for the planet Saturn. Saturn was always pictured in the ancient astronomical uh, text during the Middle Ages and the medieval times as a star of David, six-pointed star, two triangles inter, inter, uh, interposed. The Babylonians would draw a triangle 
<coughs> on the ground and then draw an opposing triangle, making the six-pointed star or a hexagram, then draw a circle around that hexagram and stand inside of it. Now you're inside the magic circle putting the hex on someone. So that's where we get the word to put the hex on you is because of the six-pointed star is a hex. So today we have Jews going around the world proud to show you that they've got the hex put on them. <laughs> Here's the goat worship. It's called the, incidentally also, uh, Saturn in the ancient uh, language, in the ancient Phoenician language, which today we call Hebrew, but it's Hebrew is actually Phoenician language. It's Hebrews who speak it. So Hebrews who speak the Phoenician language, we call, we call the language Hebrew. No, no, it's not Hebrew. It's a Phoenician language, but the Hebrews speak it. And in the ancient Phoenician language, uh, Saturn is referred to, in the, in the Phoenician language, Saturn is, is, is spelled Shabbat. Shabbat in the Phoenician language is Saturn. And from Shabbat we get Sabbath. So therefore the Hebrew Sabbath is the worship of the goat god connected to the planet Saturn. And that's why the Hebrews have their uh, holy days or Sabbath on, on sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night because that's Saturn or Saturn's day or Saturday. This is why you have the worship of Shabbat or the Sabbath. So remember to keep holy the Sabbath, which is actually saying, remember to make sure you worship Saturn on Saturn's night or Saturday night. So it's all goat worship, Saturn worship, moon worship, uh, volcano worship. Even in the Bible, in the old text, it shows um, a man riding the goat. Freemasonry uses the goat god, which can be traced, as I said, back to the old ancient Hindu. So, even in the uh, tarot card, the devil is giving the symbol of the goat god. Okay, we've looked at the Moses as the leader of the ancient lunar moon cult of Sinai. We saw him as the leader of the ancient volcano cult. We saw the volcano god's uh, son, Vulcan. Vulcan. He's still with us today on TV. <laughs> Examine another side of Moses, Moses and his mushrooms. <clears throat> We're told that Moses led the children of Israel uh, out into the wilderness, and they were given manna from heaven to live, to live on, the manna from heaven. And so we have pictures of the children of Israel picking up manna from heaven. Now, manna is a Hebrew word, or Phoenician word, which we call Hebrew. Mana is a word which means what is that? Because the word mana simply means what is it? So whatever it was they were picking up off the ground, they don't know what it is, but you can eat it. So in the Bible it says mana means what is it? Well, first of all, it was small, it was round, flaky, white, hard, and it actually came from heaven. Obviously it came from heaven. So what is a small, round, white thing? They're picking up small, round, white thing on the earth to eat. Well, you go back to Exodus again, and again it says, and when, uh, this is when the first time we hear about the manna from heaven is in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, Exodus 16, 14. And it says, and when the dew that lay on the ground in the morning, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there was a lay a small, round thing. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it is manna, for it, they did not know what it was. And so Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So we see on the, on the right-hand side, it is manna, meaning what is it? Well, whatever it is, it's small, round, and it's on the ground after the dew you know, in the morning. And they would go out and pick up these little small round things. Well, once you start getting into the words and talking with the rabbis at Solomon Wiesenthal's Center for Holocaust Studies and Rabbi Antelman and all the other uh, the authorities that I've sat and talked with for hours, it finally dawns on you what they're doing is they're picking up mushrooms. 
These are old drawings from the Middle Ages. The dew had gone up in the morning and small round things, white, were being picked up. They were picking up mushrooms. And as I said, a small round white thing. So they're eating mushrooms. The small round thing in the morning. Um, what is that? Uh, oh, here, here it is. The sacred mushroom, key to the door of eternity. The search for the secret plant of the ancients, used to send the mind to another world and into the future. By Andre Paharic. Andre Paharic was an incredible man. Had done a lot of a lot of uh, research on ancient religions and mushrooms. And um, you know, as I said, even down on the bottom, the Hindus were into mushrooms. Uh, immortal soma. Soma is another word for mushroom. The history of the magic mushroom is known the world over. It was called the food of the gods. Many, many books on this subject, a lot of them written by, uh, by religious philosophers and teachers, showing that the mushrooms were what the uh, ancient Israelites were on. They were on mushrooms. No. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it says. Small round thing you pick up in the morning. And it was obviously from heaven. Because it, you know, you could talk to God. Well, hell, of course, after you, of course you could talk to God. So here's Moses was high on drugs, Israel researchers. <laughs> Yeah, but this is in a Jewish newspaper, in, a, in the newspaper and in magazine articles in Israel. They're talking a lot about this now in Israel, about how Moses was nothing more than uh, on mushrooms. Here's another, here's another uh, newspaper, and it shows Moses uh, from the Hebrew University. Moses was tripping on Mount Sinai. Yeah, I didn't write this. This is, this is from Israel. And here's another one, talking about Moses on, on mushrooms. Here's, Moses was not only not the only one on mushrooms, Adam and Eve also beat him to it. <laughs> so the catacombs in France and, uh, and in the ancient churches were pictures of Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden. And you will see it's uh, Adam and Eve are at a mushroom. That's, this is what the Christians have no idea in the world, that Adam and Eve were always pictured with mushrooms. A Christian fresco showing Amanita Muscara as the tree of God and the evil in the Garden of Eden. There's Adam and Eve uh, at the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the mushroom. Here it is in the church, same thing. Here's a reproduction, another painting of it. So it's, it's, you find this, this, these pictures all over in Christendom in Europe, showing Adam and Eve eating from a mushroom. There's the Amanita Muscara behind Adam and Eve. There's um, a prophet over there on the left-hand side. That one guy is hanging by his feet from a mushroom. So. <laughs> He's probably had enough. And there's the Lord Jesus on the right. Yeah, so mushrooms. Well, that was the uh, you know that was in the ancient Old Testament times. But what about today? Well, let's look at the Christian Church today. Uh, there are a lot of books out there, like the Holy Mushroom, evidence of mushrooms in the Judeo-Christian system, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by John Allegro. The, the Sacred Mushroom and the Cross with John Allegro is a study of the nature and origins of Christianity within the fertility cults of the ancient Near East. Fertility cult. The, the, uh, here, is a, here is a beautiful painting, but the, the top ones shows Jesus with mushrooms beneath him, presiding over mushrooms feeding uh, 
the apostles' mushrooms. <laughs> and it's interesting because in, in Matthew 26, 26 in the, in the New Testament, uh, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body. But the word body, take, eat, and this is the Last Supper. Take, eat, for this, this represents my body. The very word body is the word soma. Soma means the body. And so if you look in the Bible uh, dictionaries, look up body in the Bible dictionary, it will say soma, mushroom. So, so much for Jesus giving his body. No, it's the body of the mushroom. You'll see the mushroom around uh, the head. There's the Amanita Boscara. Jesus dying on the mushroom. So Christmas is Jesus' birthday, so naturally the symbols will match. So in Christmas, you have mushroom heads, Santa Claus on the mushroom, mushroom trinkets, all kinds of um, Christmas decorations dealing with mushrooms. Yeah, and the reef is filled with mushrooms. Most people don't know, why do you have a reef, a Christmas reef on your door? A reef was always a symbol of someone dying. It's because the sun dies, so God's sun is dead, so they have a Christmas reef. That's a whole other subject when I get into astral theology. That, that's a whole day's subject of, of breaking down the story of the New Testament for the first time explaining what the New Testament was actually saying. When you find out uh, the symbolism and the words and the terms of the New Testament and what the story really was, it was called astrotheology. It's an encoded story. So the story of Jesus is an encoded story. We hear about Bible codes all the time. But there's another code which most people have no idea about, and that's the story of Jesus in the New Testament is an encoded story. And so once you figure, or once you have for the first time, see what the symbols mean, what the words meant, then you begin to understand what the story is all about. It's a symbolic story, and most people have no idea of what they're looking at. And so they're taking the New Testament as historical fact, when in point of fact, the, the New Testament is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. And if you don't know the symbols, you're never going to figure out what the symbolic story that's encoded in it. Very interesting stuff when you get into the real story of Jesus. Again, mushrooms are always in the Middle East and, and even uh, in Europe, always connected to the mushroom. Santa Claus, the mushroom. Incidentally, too, Santa, S-A-N-T-A, S-A-N-T-A, you can interpose the A and the T and becomes Satan, S-A-N-S-A-T-A-N. <laughs> so in conclusion, we see that Moses and the manna from heaven that the Hebrews are picking was mushrooms. And with this knowledge, we can see the logic of the headdress. All the high priests in the Middle East, their headdress was always a mushroom. Mushroom heads. <laughs> yeah. Today, I mean, that, is that a mushroom? One, uh, the upside down mushroom. Back. Now here's a here's a mushroom head. Here's a bunch of mushrooms. That one chump on the left looks like he's been on it for a while. <laughs> so, time to say goodbye to the mushroom heads. So, you know, Judaism is uh, connected to mushrooms. So much for the law of Moses.
I guess that's it for that one. The reason I'm dealing with this subject in public is because it has become apparent to me that, there, that this is an idea whose time has come to tell the people the truth. Uh, because there's a world of difference between religion and spirituality. And the, what, what the world is now heading into politically, uh, the chaos which is coming, and it's coming quickly now, <clears throat> people are beginning to awaken all over the world to the fact that they don't have the truth. And they've been lied to by their government and by their religions. And I started talking about this subject of the Knights Templars, the Illuminati, secret societies, the Bible codes, all of this stuff back in 1960. I think it was 60 and 61 I was doing my first uh, mom and pop lectures at the little, uh, the little um, libraries and bookstores. And I would, I would go around all over Los Angeles giving lectures on secret societies, astro theology, occultism and religion, government, conspiracies. Like I said, and I used to go to some of the studios late at night. Uh, I, I could get a pass to get in. Some of the guys that were working at the studio would get me a pass to get in at night. And I would go to some of the studios at night and give uh, slide presentations on Bible codes, the Illuminati, and Knights Templars, and international banking. And that was back in the 60s. And then I got into the, the really dark stuff, Nazism, communism, fascism, and was doing lectures all around Los Angeles in the late, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and today, of course, the subject is now worldwide. Now it's all over the world, and they're making movies like Da Vinci Code and National Treasure and, and God knows all this other stuff. But this is the subject I was talking about as far back in 1960. And I'm telling you that today, people are finally awakening to the fact that we've been lied to by banks, by government, the police department isn't what you think it is. Nothing in this world operates the way you think it does. And we can talk about that later. So my point is, is that I have the highest of respect for spirituality and for God, so to speak. I have the highest of reverence and, and, and spiritual uh, integrity I have a very high respect for the divine in nature and in the divine in the universe. I totally believe in God, so to speak, whatever God is. God is simply a word, dog spelled backwards. But whatever it is, but uh, and this is why you have church dogma. But whatever is in fact out there is extraordinarily powerful, extraordinarily brilliant and profound in its presence in the universe. And we humans have not even begun to, to, uh, to scrape the surface of what's out there. As one astronomer said, the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. So I want to, I want to express this so you understand. I have the highest of respect for what we have co commonly called God. I am totally convinced that there is a higher force in the universe, a matrix of power that is far, far more brilliant and powerful than anything uh, we have ever contemplated. But I think it's an idea whose time has come to explain to people that your religions are based on the old Masonic orders coming out of the Middle East, the Knights Templars. The people we call the international bankers were actually Knights Templars and the Knights of Malta coming out of the Catholic Church coming into Europe and ultimately into America. And so I, I have no respect for religion whatsoever. I think it's fascinating to watch how people will believe things and not, not, you know, not do any research and find out where these belief systems have come from. This is why Christians are referred to as believers. You know, if you go to a new church, they'll ask you, how long have you been a believer? <laughs> believer? I want to know something for God's sake. No, you don't need to believe. Go get a book and read and study and find out what it is that you are believing. Because when you find out that, and I think it's important because the Christians have the idea, and it's also expressed in Judaism and in Islam, that when you die, uh, you're going to go before God 
and you're going to be judged. Well, if that's true, then I would suggest all Christians and Jews and Muslims should begin to start thinking seriously about what you're going to say when you get, when on the other side, when you die, if you're going to go before God as a, as a judge, if that's what's going to happen, then you have better start thinking deeply about what you're going to say when you're made to look like an ass in front of everybody. Because when you find out that everything you believe was a bunch of bull, it was all man-made stuff given to you by the Knights Templars and all the secret societies of Freemasonry coming out of Europe, and the church was nothing more than a Masonic order financing, financed and promoted by the old Roman aristocracy of Rome, and that the entire superstructure of Western civilization is commerce, money, banking, and has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with spirituality. Uh, Moses was in the mushrooms and volcanoes. So I'm just saying we need to wake up and start doing some real research on what is life. Where did we come from? What is God? Um, because if we don't, the whole human race is going to be raped. We are seeing it today. We are nothing more than a, uh, a human resource. That's all we are. And we need to wake up and take back our spirituality, and you're never going to do it if you're hanging around in churches and synagogues and, and mosques. That's not where the truth is. The truth is like, uh, <coughs> like they said on television, the truth is out there. So I want you to understand, I am not criticizing spirituality of God. I'm criticizing corporate religions. I think I've had enough of it. Thank you. Now, I have a second uh, presentation, but it's only six, so I th think we could take a bit of a break, yep. and then I'll, I'll, I'll really scare you with the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. This is a very big subject, and I could talk for hours on, uh, and some of you out here in the audience already know the subject better than I do. Uh, I'm talking about maritime admiralty law. <coughs> we talked about Moses being the lawgiver, and we see that so much of the Old Testament, and as I said, the New Testament too, is symbolic, and there's all kinds of uh, stuff in the Bible that people don't know, and so it takes many years of of research and study to find all of this stuff. But today in America, since 9-11, we're living under a total totalitarian dictatorship. <clears throat> as far as I am concerned, if you were, and I, this is just my opinion, but if you were to take all of the evil and all the badness in the world that there is around the globe, the, the wars, the bloodshed, the hypocrisy, the lies, um, or the drugs, the drug trafficking, wars, all of it. If you take your time and take a few years and go back and start studying where all this stuff has come from, it will lead you back to the Catholic Church. Because you have to remember that for 2,700 years, Rome has dominated Europe. Under the old Roman Empire, the Caesars were God. And they dominated Europe. And Europe dominated the world. Europe dominated the whole planet, and, the whole, and Caesar dominated Europe. <coughs> and when the Roman Empire collapsed, uh, it continued it continued without let up, but now it was no longer called the Roman Empire, it was called the Roman Universal Religion, or the Roman Catholic, because Catholic simply means universal. This is why I found out many years ago, Universal Studios, the land was owned by the Catholic Church, that's why it's called Universal, because Catholic is Latin, universal. So, <coughs> I believe that the Catholic Church, my mother was Catholic, my whole family were Catholic, all my family were Catholic, my poor mother who's gone, my father and my family were all Catholic. 
So I'm not criticizing the Catholic people. I'm talking about a corporation that has been in power for like 1,600 years. The Vatican has dominated Europe, and for 1,600 years, Europe has dominated the world. And so if you take the time to do the research, you will find that all of the, the stuff that's going on on the earth today, all roads lead to Rome. The underworld, drug trafficking, meddling cartels out of South America, Central America, the drug cartels, Mexico. Mexico and Central and South America are Catholic. So you better look at the church and find out what's really going on in Rome and who the Pope really is. And Pope comes from a Latin word, Papa. Pope is Papa. And Papa is a door. Because your Papa was the door to life. So that's why you call him Papa. Papa is also Pope, comes from Papa. But you, so Papa is a door, but you can't open a door without a hinge. So in Latin, a hinge is called a cardinal. And so it's like a cardinal point on a map, a cardinal point on the zodiac, cardinal is a hinge. And so the cardinals are the hinges for Papa to open the door to the Babylonian mysteries of Dagon, to the world. So the Catholic Church is opening the doors, the Pope is opening the doors to the Babylonian mysteries of Dagon. And, and, on, and when you find out what Rome really is and how it is a, a, a continuation of the Roman Empire, and that Caesar, under the, under the ancient Roman system, Caesar was called Pontifex Maximus, or the great bridge builder. Well today, that is the term that is given now to the Pope. Pontifex Maximus, the great bridge builder. Bridge builder being because he builds bridges to other nations. Takes over this country, that country, that country, and takes over here, and so he's building bridges to the whole world. The bridge builder, Pontifex Maximus, the Holy Father. And let me tell you one thing for damn sure, there is nothing holy in Rome. There ain't never been nothing holy in Rome. We're talking about Caesar, we're talking about pure power the power of the sword. And so there's nothing holy in Rome. There ain't never been nothing holy in Israel, ever. And there's nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There's nothing holy in any of these holy cities. The very word holy like, comes from holly. And as I've said so many times, the old Druids, who today, the Druids still run America. America's a Druidic country. Europe is a Druidic establishment. And then the old Druids of Europe, but even before the Roman Empire ever existed in Europe, Europe was run by a religious priesthood called the Druids. And so much of Druidism is in the Catholic Church and Judaism. Uh, it's filled with Druidism. One of the most important symbols in the Druid religion, as I've said so many times, one of the most important Druidic symbols in that ancient priesthood was a magic wand like like Merlin the magician with his magic wand, or the orchestra leader, when he walks out before the orchestra, everyone's going to play to his tune. He's the master. Watch the magic wand. He calls the shots. So the magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of Hollywood. Okay? And so once you understand that Hollywood is a druidic white man's establishment for distributing magic and power around the world, and that's what Hollywood does. It's a magical system that takes your mind and puts it down somewhere else and leads you through propaganda. And Hollywood has been telling us stuff for years that people have no idea in the world what's going on. Hollywood's telling you stories, but you're not listening. You're seeing it as entertainment. So I've, I've called this one where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Fascism, world fascism. If you go to the World Book Encyclopedia and look up fascism, it's got an article on fascism, and it says, life under fascism, political life. In most cases, fascists have come to power after the nation has suffered an economic collapse, sound familiar, a military defeat, or some other disaster. The fascists win mass support by promising to revive the economy and restore national pride. 
They may also appeal to the fear of communism or hatred of Jews or other minorities. Uh, usually a dictator with a great popular appeal becomes the leader of the government. A great popular appeal. So, and so the people put all their hopes and faith on him. Fascists permit no other political party, no opposition to their policies. The fascist desire of national glory leads to an increase in military spirit and a buildup of the armed forces. And after the military forces become strong, they may invade and occupy other countries. We're talking world fascism, America, Roman fascism. The organizations which consist both of workers and employees are called corporations. And these are fascist corporations. Then it says uh, <clears throat> a fascist country is sometimes recur referred to as a corporate state. And that's what we have. The United States is a corporation. It's a privately owned corporation. We can talk about that later, maybe. Personal liberty is severely limited under a fascist government. The government also controls newspapers, radio, and other means of communication in, this co in the country. It issues propaganda to promote its policies and practices strict censorship to silence opposing views. That's what we have in America today. Strict censorship by foreign people out of Rome who have come here. They're called Jesuits. It's called Jesuit. It's called Catholic. It's called Roman. It's called fascism. A fasci is a bundle of sticks with a hatchet. A bundle of sticks tied together with a hatchet is called a fascist. A fascist is a bundle of rods containing an axe with the blade projecting, projecting uh, born before the Roman magistrate as an emblem of official power. <clears throat> In the ancient world, all almost, almost all ancient civilizations that have ever existed used the same symbol for uh, divine power in government. Always was an axe. The axe was, was always a symbol for political power. So today, if you know, they're going to fire you, you're going to get the axe. You know, you know, because the axe symbolized a final cutoff. Caesar is absolute master. And whatever it is he puts his hand down on the axe, that's it. You're through. Your head rolls. So a fascist is a bundle of sticks with a hatchet head. Now why a bundle of sticks? Because one stick can be broken. But you put a bundle of sticks and it becomes known as, Jimmy, as, uh, as Bush used to talk about a coalition. We have a coalition of, of states. A coalition. Yeah. A bunch of fascists getting together. Yeah. Instead of one uh, Crips or blood confronting, no, no, if 17 of them come together, now you've got a problem, right? So it's a coalition, yeah. But it's not so easy to beat when there's 15 of them around your car as it is for one. So we're talking about a fascist, a fasci as a bundle of sticks, a coalition of nations, and they're all fascists and they're all working together. So it's a gang war, one gang against another gang. There it is, a Roman fascist used on Roman coins. It was a symbol of power in the Roman Empire. It says, um, here, the lector who held the fascist, this was an axe bound with a bundle of sticks, symbolized the official's power to punish and execute people. All he's got to do is say, this guy's head goes off, and he's God. He is Caesar, and that's it. So the axe represented the power to kill, the power of Caesar. And the axe, of course, as I said, was always very sacred symbol. I've got books on this, uh, on this one subject of the sacred axe. There is a sacred axe in the Roman Empire. Here's another symbol of the fasci from Rome. So you'll find the fasci all over uh, in World War II. Yeah, here's Goofies uh, today playing like Caesar and they're carrying the fasci and have no idea in the world what that symbol represents. It's the most reprehensible 
in my opinion, most reprehensive, filthiest and degenerate symbol for giving one man the power over a whole nation to kill whoever he chooses to and do whatever he wants with the people. That's fascism. And that's why in Washington, D.C., you will always see on each side of the president, fascists. Absolute, total Roman fascism. Totalitarian Roman state. And anybody that don't like it is going to prison. They'll find a misplaced comma on your income tax and you will go to jail. And um, incredible. It's on the American dimes. Is that why the Pope came to the U.S. in May of 19, uh, 2008? Say again? The Pope came to the U.S. to Washington, D.C. on May 15 of 2008. Yeah, you know, and uh, and he went to uh, he went to New York, uh, to uh, to uh, New York to what do they call it, um, Ground Zero. But I thought it was interesting. Go back and look at it. The Pope came to New York to honor uh, you know what happened in New York, and he went to Ground Zero in New York City on April tenth, two thousand nine. April tenth, Hitler's birthday. The birthday of Adolf Hitler. 20th. My birthday is 20th. 20th. 20th then. That's when he was there. See how I feel that. We took France in 17 days. Here you have the crossing of the fasci, and you'll see the papal mitre, the papal symbol beneath the crossing of the fasci. That's a very, very powerful Roman symbol. The two fasci is crossing. That's a Roman Catholic symbol. There it is again, the crossing of the fasci. Roman symbol for the United States Senate. Because in ancient Rome, in ancient Rome, Caesar, the reference books will tell you, all the encyclopedias will tell you that Caesar's seat of power where he sat to rule Rome was on a hill called Capitoline Hill, or Capitol Hill. And on Capitol Hill, Caesar each morning would go up to be the official over the Roman Senate. And so today we have people who think they're God going up on the hill, and we hear that. Yeah, well, up on the hill today, so and the president said this, and the president said that. What you're talking about is fascist masters up on the Capitoline Hill. The red cap? Oh, the red cap is the, is the Phrygian cap of revolution. That's a whole different, that's another story, of the Phrygian cap. It has to do with sex. It's a sexual symbol, and it was used in Rome, but that's another story. Well, yes? Yeah, well, the Phrygian, yeah, the Phrygian, the Phrygian uh, cap, it's called the Phrygian cap of revolution. Anyway, I don't want to get off the subject. The point being now is that the United States Senate, the symbol, is the crossing of the Roman Catholic fasci. And like I said, Caesar is up on the hill overseeing the Senate. Uh, here we go back to the Acts again. In Egypt, the Acts was God. I have all of this, I think, I'm not sure if I have this uh, on a video. Joe, is this stuff on, on the three books? Uh, do, we don't have that on it. That's right. Okay. All of this stuff I'm telling you right now is on a video, uh, is on a DVD I have, which is called Priesthood of the Elias. So you need to get this priesthood of the Iliads because it's, and it's an incredible story. It explains the axes, the axe, and why it was called the axis powers, Adolf Hitler's axis powers, and how the axe was used by each one of these ancient empires. That, that priesthood of the Iliads, yeah, that's good, thank you. It's called priesthood of the Iliads. I thought I had it. Priesthood of the Iliads, it's, a, it's three books in one, and it's, uh, it's text only. Not a video, it's a text, but it's three different books written by the same author 
on all of the heavy duty occultism of world government, Catholic Church, uh, religion, the Senate, who the Congress was, and who, where these words have come from, extraordinary stuff. It's probably one of the most interesting books, uh, the three books in one. And I put them all three together in one and call it the priesthood of the Ilias because in the old Babylonian system, the gods were called the Ilus, I-L-E-S, Ilus. And they lived up in the hills. And so, priesthood of the Ilias, you'll want to get because it's got all of this stuff I'm talking about tonight. It's all on there. Anyway. No, no, it's just documents only. It's just three books. It's three, it's three books uh, put into one. One long book. I don't know, it's about 300 pages or more. But every page is just filled with stuff that will blow your mind. Where the, you know, what the symbols mean, what the words meant, how Caesar did what he did, and what the words were in, in the ancient Roman, and how they're translated into English today, what the courts were, why the Pope is called the Holy See, what the word see meant. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating study. It's called The Priesthood of the Ilias. I think I've plugged this enough. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you, if you're interested in occultism and mysticism, the high mysticism of world government and world religion, Priesthood of the Ilias. I got a few left. So, in America, the axe was God. We saw that with the president. Sees the, the, on each side of the president, you will see. The, uh, and of course, the playing cards has the kings. Oh, I think I even have it in here. <clears throat> in America, the axe was God. In Rome, the axe was God. Again, the Roman fascists. Uh, here we have the word, fascist comes from the word fas, F-A-S. There are two words in the Roman language. One is J-U-S. J-U-S gives us the word justice. J-U-S in Latin is man's law. The law of man in Latin is called J-U-S, from which we get our word justice. But the word fas, F-A-S, that which is right and just in the sight of God, as distinguished from just, which is more frequently referred to as the right and the aspect of man-made law. So there are two kinds of law. There's fas, which is God's law, or just, which is man's law. And so uh, fas, which gives us the word fascism, divine law. And so the kings of Europe, kings of England, kings all over Europe, and princes, and all of the royalty, uh, we say that they have a divine right of kings. But no one's ever stopped to think, what are you talking about divine right? <clears throat> that sounds like a God appointed them. Well, in fact, no, God didn't appoint anybody. This is a man-made trick. Men come up with all this crap. It's all man-made stuff. But when you're talking about God's law, you're talking about the Pope. You're talking about the Vatican. Because in Europe, all the royalty are made royalty by the blessing of the Pope. And so that's why you can say that you have a divine right, because the papacy and the Pope has anointed you to be king of England. So therefore, you have a divine right. Why? Well, because he represents God, and he said you could be king. The problem is he could also say tomorrow night that he decided, God decided he don't want you to be king anymore. So it's a man-made system. So FOSS is simply divine law or command. The bundle of rods. That's why Jesus is holding the bundle of rods. Fascism and world conflict. Remember Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy? You'll see the fasci on his uh, emblem. Here's Mussolini meeting with his uh, international banker friends in Italy. Here's the Italian flag with the fasci. The eagle is perched on the fasci, and, and this is an interesting, because this is in uh, Italy, <coughs> and Benito Mussolini's symbol is an eagle perched on a fasci. Again, fasci is divine law. Well, here is how it's divine law. Here's, how, here's where we get the idea of divine law. Here's Benito Mussolini 
getting the imprimatur of the Pope. The Pope has declared Mussolini to be the divine emperor of the new Italian state. And so Mussolini has to go there with all of his other high school friends. And um, <laughs> yeah, and so there's Mussolini signing the concordat. There was a concordat, it's a contract that Mussolini had to sign with the Pope to become emperor of, of uh, Italy. Here they are signing it at the Vatican, signing the papers. And now here it is at the Vatican, Vatican City State comes into being, there's Mussolini with the Pope and all the clergy. And um, I'm not going to stay too long on these, on these quotes, I'm just going to go through it pretty quick. Mussolini had a fascist friend named Adolf Hitler. Hitler was also a fascist. Um, and the, between the two of them, there were two sticks. And then they, ordered, they, they, they gathered some other nations to come in with them, and then it became known as a coalition. Two fascists, and there it is, Hitler and Mussolini, the eagle with the fascist head, the, uh, the, the ox. So on one side you'll see the fasci, and on the other side you'll see the eagle perched on the the sun, swastika. Just as Mussolini had to kiss up to the boss of all bosses in Rome, how many of you saw um, Godfather Three, the third one? Remember Michael Corleone, the, the mobster uh, from the, the one of the families, and he's in, he's in the Vatican and doing business with the Pope, directly with the Pope. And at the beginning of Godfather Three. Michael is, uh, is in New York City being anointed in the Catholic Church by the Cardinal in New York uh, to make him a member of the Knights of Malta. Knights of Malta is a Masonic lodge within the Catholic Church. And these guys are really bloodthirsty. You talk about fascists and Nazis, mess with the Knights of Malta. They are serious bad. So here we have uh, Mussolini again with the papal authorities signing the new contract so he can become emperor. But they have to go to, uh, you know, they have to, he always has to go to Rome first. You always, you don't form your own family without getting the, uh, you know, Michael Corleone to agree to it. The old man says you don't form your own family. So until the Pope says that you can be an emperor, you know, you don't claim anything until the old man says so. So there's Mussolini with all of his uh, cohorts and the Pope. So Hitler and the Nazis had to. So Hitler and the Nazis had to do the same thing. So they had to go sign a contract with the old mob boss in Rome. So Hitler goes to Rome and signs a contract in Rome. Here he is at the Vatican. Adolf Hitler with the Pope. And there he is, uh, there's Hitler's uh, uh, two representatives, uh, and they're sitting there with the Pope, having their picture taken when they're signing a contract with the Pope also. So when I hear all of this stuff about the Jews this and the Jews that, and the Jews are doing this and the Jews are doing that, and the Jews are responsible for this or that, I'm, my feeling is you better go back and do some homework. You don't have it yet. The Jews don't run anything, period. They're good with figures. They're good because they've got good minds, and they're great with, uh, uh, with law and with figures and banking. And so the powers that be behind the world throne <coughs> uses Jews because they're good. They know what they're doing. But the power, the real power, in the Holy Father. And that's why Jews are told to wear the yarmulke, because the Pope wears the yarmulke. And Jews wear the round yarmulke thinking it's a Jewish symbol. It is not Jewish symbol at all. Yarmulke is a Roman symbol. That's why the Pope wears the yarmulke. And all the cardinals wear the yarmulke. It's a Roman symbol. And the Jews were told to wear the yarmulke to show that you are in subjection to the Holy Father, because he is the boss of all bosses in Europe and around the world, period. 
Jews don't stand a chance when it comes to the real powers of this world who are actually running governments behind the scenes. You're talking about fascist world power. You're talking about the Pope in Rome, not the Jews. Better go back and do some homework. That's, um, what's his name? Goebbels. So when Hitler spoke of the Third Reich, meaning the Third Empire, he was speaking about the restoration of the Holy Roman Empire. The papacy symbols with the swastika. That's in the Vatican. Pictures of the Nazi Catholic priest. Hitler with the papal nuncio. Catholic cardinals. Secretary of State. Here's the papal, uh, the papal Secretary of State leaving uh, a meeting with Adolf Hitler. Another one. Here's another one. See the Nazis standing on both sides and there's the Papal Secretary of State leaving. <coughs> so, Hitler was always like to have his picture taken coming out of churches. It makes you look religious. And, yeah. and of course he would bow his head in prayer better because the Holy Father you know, will have your head because he don't give a damn how smart you think you are or how powerful you think you are. You mess with the Holy Father and you're a dead man. Period. So, Hitler had to uh, <clears throat> appeal to the Catholic Church and um, basically do whatever the church says do. So here you have the Catholic clergy hiring Hitler, Catholic priests hiring Hitler. You know. Nazi soldiers watching these fruitcakes walk by. Yeah. Catholic, Catholic cardinals overseeing the, the troops, you know, owing, overseeing the, the Nazi troops. <coughs> Catholic priests standing up there. Nazi Catholic. Nazi celebration for the Catholic bishop. Here are the SS and Gestapo guys going to church. Yeah, it kind of makes you feel warm all over knowing that these guys are going to church. Then they go out and kill babies and children. There's the Catholic cross with the uh, swastika. See, a lot of this history people do not know. That Adolf Hitler was put into power by the Vatican, not Jews. As a matter of fact, all of the royalty of Europe are put there by the papacy. That's why they have a divine, as I said, a divine right. They're put there by the papacy. Jews didn't put them there. The Vatican put them there. Reich Catholic bishop with the Nazis. I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that was going on in Germany, in Nazi Germany, that people have never been told. Where Adolf Hitler got his money, where he got the backing, how he was being financed. Here's Cardinal Pacelli, became later became known as Pope Pius XII. Cardinal Pacelli used to go up to uh, Hitler's residence to bring the orders from the Pope. Also, General Franco in Spain, he had the bomb kiss the ring too. That's General Franco in Spain, uh, who was also a fascist, General Franco, the fascist dictator of Spain. Uh, all the military would line up to go kiss the Holy Father's ring. Because you don't, you don't, you don't build an empire unless you talk to the boss first. You go and show respect to the old man. You go into and kiss the ring and get on your knees. 
Yeah. Back to Mussolini and the, fa and the Vatican Euro fascism. As I said, you see Mussolini and the priest, Heiling, Hitler, and Mussolini going to visit the convents where all the nuns are. All the Nazis with the priest. The military loves to bow down, kneel, and kiss the ring of the emperor. And so today, even in America, when the Pope comes to America, America crawls on its knees before the Roman emperor. What a pathetic situation. Americans crawling on their knees to a foreign dignitary. The Vichy government, this is in France. The Vichy government were Frenchmen who, you know, who, who took the side of Hitler and protected the Pope. And so the point I'm making here is that the clergy of the Catholic Church are responsible for Adolf Hitler, Mussolini, General Latissimo, Franco. There's another Vatican Nazi group called Eustachi, the way I pronounce it. Now of all the Vatican military establishments, the Eustachi is in Croatia. These guys were top of the line, big time murderers. The Nazis, who they were on the, they were on the Nazi side during the Second World War, but the Nazis wrote about Eustachi in Croatia, and they said, these people are crazy. <laughs> now when you get the Nazi SS and the Gestapo saying that those people over there are crazy, they, the, the Nazis didn't want to have anything to do with these people because they are loony. They're killing anything, children, dogs, women, raping and plundering. These guys are really off the wall. They love the Lord Jesus, and they are, they're crawling on their knees to the Pope, and you'll see some of the stuff they did. Yes? I'm from Croatia. They, uh, uh, we pronounce it Ustashi. We pronounce the U, uh, and we emphasize the Ashi. Ustashi. Ustashi. Then you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> me. <laughs> Croatian Catholic clergy. There they are, the Franciscan monks. And today we think of, oh, they're so holy, the Franciscan monks. Holy? You better go back and find out who these holy orders of Franciscan monks really are. clergy with the military. There's something called the Vatican Rat Line. Any, how, how many of you have ever heard of the Rat Line? The Rat Line was when Germany was losing the war. Once it was decided by the generals that the war was lost and the Germans were going to lose. Well, they didn't, you know, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure that out when all of Russia is on one side and all the Americans are on the other side and they're only about five miles from town, uh, you can figure you probably have lost a war. It's probably <laughs> over. And so the Vatican immediately wanted to get all the top Nazis out of Germany quickly, all the scientists, all the intellectuals. So they formed a secret group called the Vatican Rat Line. And the Rat Line, of course, is the is uh, on a ship, when it's parked in the harbor, it's tied off at the harbor, and when the ship is unseaworthy, for some reason ca uh, rats, as dumb as they are, know the ship is not seaworthy, so the rats come down the rope and get off of the ship. And so it's called the rat line. Well, the rats that were working for the Vatican, we call them the Nazi hierarchy, 
they knew that the war was lost, so they had to get out of Germany because the Russians are coming and they're looking for you. And the Americans are looking for you too, but the Russians, they are really looking for you. <laughs> what you did to Moscow, there's a big payback coming. And so all the top Nazis were slipped out of Germany quickly through the Vatican. They were taken into the Vatican, give false passports, false ID, and quickly through the CIA. The CIA worked with the Vatican to get all the top Nazis out of Germany quickly. So before anything happens, at least save the brains of Germany, all the Nazi brains. And so they were sent to Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, Mexico, and the really dirty ones, the real top of the line Nazi murderers, they were brought to Washington, D.C., and they founded what we call the CIA and NASA. NASA is a Nazi organization. What Dr. Werner von Braun and all the German Nazis that came out of Germany under Hitler. I mean, this is a real story. When you find out how this, how this government really works. So it's called the Rat Line. The Vatican, the Nazis, and the New World Order. Here were some of the escapees that the Vatican got out of Germany quickly. Adolf Eichmann, um, Klaus Barbie, um, Joseph Mengele. Uh, these are just some of the main Nazis that the Vatican quickly and gave them money and false passports to get them out of Germany. To get them out of Germany. The Serbs were encouraged to show respect and love for the Vatican's Holy Father. You go back. The Serbs were encouraged to show respect and love for the Vatican's Holy Father by converting to Catholicism. So the idea was is that the Vatican wanted the Serbs to uh, convert to Catholicism, and they would force them to convert. And it's very easy to force people to convert because the alternative is to have your head cut off. <laughs> and so here is the um, priest blessing the new Catholics. Because if you didn't convert, this is what you got. They would chop your head off. They would saw your head off with a saw. Here they are sawing this guy's head off. They're proud to show you. This is the head we just cut off. Here they're chopping a guy's head off. Another one, they're chopping his head off. Catholic priests even had uh, posters. Here's another one. The guy is cutting this guy's throat, and the other guy is holding a bowl under it to catch the blood. Here are the um, killing people in mass. So it kind of reminds me of the Vatican Inquisition. How many of you are aware of something called the Inquisition? Yeah. Well, that's what's going on in Washington, D.C., under the bushes. The Inquisition, the Holy Father, and all that crap. Yeah. The Inquisition, where they tortured people. We found out that you do not love the Holy Father, and you do not love the Lord Jesus. Well, this is what you're going to get. And so when you find out all this torture, burning people at the stake, torture, all kinds of hideous, demonic depravity, burning human beings alive on a stake. Humans had to be put on a stake and burned while the Holy Father sat there and blessed the whole thing. Waterboarding, burning at the stake, torture, taking a baby and pounding its head against the, uh, a post, hanging their family, driving nails into a human foot. It's just incredible, the torture that was meted out to human beings by the Vatican. Sawing people in two with sores. This is the Catholic Church. Not the Jews. Rome. Back to the symbol of fascism and what it means for you and your family today. FOSS, 
means uh, God's law, divine law. 2,700 years Romans dominated Europe, and through Europe the entire world has been dominated for 2,700 years by Rome. So for the last 1,685 years, the popes in the Vatican has been the boss of all bosses of both secular and spiritual, so that all who would, rule, who would rule today Europe and America by divine right do so through the Holy Father in Rome as a representative of God on the earth. So here you have Nancy Pelosi kissing the ring of a foreign dictator. Now, you know, if, if Today, it would be called treason, but most people don't know what treason means because nobody uses it anymore. But as an American, if you're bowing down and kissing the ring of a foreign dictator, that tells you where America's at. There was a time in America when we were a free people standing up for freedom and liberty and, the, and having nothing to do with foreign dictators. Today, we have these pusillanimous traitors bowing down and kissing the ring of a foreign dictator. This is a very sick country. You'll see the king and he's holding the earth with the cross on it. So here is how this fasci Roman Vatican plays into our world today. Here's God, he's always pictured in a triangle three gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, always the triune God because it goes back to Egypt, the pyramid of the triangle. But you'll see he's holding in his hand, God is holding in his hand the earth. And one day God had a son, his name was Jesus. So God's son grew up and was named Jesus. Now, Later, God's son became king of kings and lord of lords. So now he's the king of all kings and lord of all lords. Why? Because God the Father created and owned the earth. And he holds the earth in his hands, so to speak. So if God owns the earth and all things on it, and he holds the earth in his hands, well, that's why the kings use that symbol. Because that's the earth dominated by the Roman Catholic religion, the cross of Caesar. So now God's Son has been given the right to own and rule the earth and all life on it for God, for God his Father, so Jesus has the right to rule the earth any way he chooses. So therefore the theology is, is that the church teaches that Jesus is now the owner of the earth and everything on it. And his earth, it belongs to him alone, so in fact he is the sovereign over the whole earth. Jesus is the owner and the sovereign over the whole earth. And he is a good and kind sovereign, but a sovereign nonetheless. So he holds the earth in his hands. And it follows that the first responsibility of a sovereign is to lay down the laws for us as earthly subjects. So therefore we all have to submit ourselves to God's law, the law of God, uh, from Mount Sinai with, with uh, volcanoes and mushrooms and all the rest of that crap. Yeah. Those lawyers, those laws would be binding on all people of the earth because those laws are in fact God's law. So God has given us his law through Moses. But since God's son, Jesus, is living with his father in heaven, so Jesus is up in heaven now with God's father, God the father, so somebody has to be appointed by God to stand in for and represent the sovereign of the earth, Jesus. Since Jesus owns the earth, he's the, he's the absolute sovereign over the earth, uh, but he's not here right now. He's busy elsewhere, so he's not here. So somebody has to run the earth for Jesus until he comes back. So to administer his laws and world government for the people of the earth, Jesus is the God of all the earth, and of course the, the, the kings of the, of the earth, the princes, and, and in this way uh, the Middle Ages, the church was always behind the kings, always advising them, because the king realized that Jesus owns the earth. So don't do anything as a king until you talk to the Holy Father. Because that's how you got to have that divine right. And if he decides that you've done something he didn't tell you to do, he will withdraw that divine right, and then they're going to cut the king's head off. 
just like John F. Kennedy, the Catholic who decided he wanted to do something for America. And he figured the Catholic Church is not going to tell him what to do. He's going to do what he wants to do. As a, and he said that. And when his, in his inauguration speech, he said, I'm accepting the presidency of the United States as a free American, and I'll not be beholden to any foreign power on my decisions. Well, they took care of him quick enough. <laughs> he won't do that no more. So there, there he is, the Holy Father, who incidentally was a Nazi, and still is. And there's our president bowing down and curtsying to a foreign power. This stuff scares me because I realize how serious this really is. When the United States government and the president is conspiring with foreign powers like Rome, no wonder you have waterboarding and torture and bloodshed all over the Middle East. There's some heavy-duty political stuff going on here, and Rome is behind it. The Holy Father, here's the Holy Father in the White House, in the Capitol. Incidentally, the Washington Monument, this is just a little incidental point, the Washington Monument is an obelisk, it's an Egyptian obelisk. Egyptian obelisk also always represented the male phallic, okay? Washington Monument was a male erection, and it always connected to the oval or the female ovaries, the oval office. Sexual symbol, Rome, bloodshed, violence, volcanoes, all fun, it's all incredible crap. At the Vatican, Bush is visiting the Holy Father. I got to tell you, there's nothing holy in Rome. There's uh, Jeb Bush on his knees before the Holy Father. Yeah, he joined Jeb Bush's knighted into the uh, Knights of Columbus. And you'll see the Knights of Columbus symbol is a fasci. Yeah, here she is, Democrat Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, kissing the ring. Now, this particular picture of the Pope looks like a demonic. <laughs> yeah. He looks demonic, doesn't he? He's saying, yeah, kiss it. I am your father. <laughs> Not going to do that anymore. So here you got both sides, Democrat, Republican, and the papacy in between. Always in the middle of everything is the papacy in New York, Nixon and Kennedy, the Vatican, Obama, the Vatican. Obama on one side and that other goofball airhead on the other. <laughs> yeah, and the Vatican in between. And, and all the people around, all the people down and below and, and above, they're all very happy to be there with the papacy and the, and the Holy Father and all this, and they're all just delighted as punch to be there in the presence of the filthiest, most degenerate, fascist world ruler the world has ever known. And Americans just love it. They cannot get enough of crawling on their knees to the emperor and to the Holy Father and to the queen's mum. When queen mum comes over here, people fall all over themselves. Americans are the most ignorant, ill-informed, dim-witted people on the face of the damn earth. <laughs> I'd like to see a whole new renaissance of intellectual, spiritual revolution in the world. Amen.
Look. This may explain the European Union. Constitution was signed for the new European Union in Rome before a statue of the Pope. This is where the European Union was founded, in Rome, before the Holy Father. So today when you hear about the Euro and the European uh, Union, it's Roman. The Holy Father has decided he's had enough of all this BS about freedom, liberty, and justice, and all of these people running around with their silly nonsense about freedom and liberty and justice. So they're going to teach you a lesson. Nobody tells Caesar that they're free. Nobody. Period. So you're going to break your country, destroy your economy, destroy your youth, we're going to destroy everything that you have ever built up, and one day you're going to crawl on your knees to the Holy Emperor of Rome. And then you're going to remember when your founding fathers told the church to screw off, and from here on out, you're not, you're not allowed to come into this country. This country is going to be free. And then Rome does not forget. Rome did not forget that, what the, what the founding fathers of America did. And so when you tell the, you know, the, the boss of all bosses that from now on you stay over there in Europe and you do whatever you're going to do over there, but you don't come here. And the Catholic Church was not allowed to operate in the, new co in the colonies, was not allowed to operate here. Catholics could not operate in America, period. Because if nothing else, the Freemasons who founded America realized, well, if we don't want that screwball with all of his henchmen and murderers coming over here to run this country. And so what the Catholic Church did is they immediately sent people into the Jesuits, came to Mexico, and came in from the back door. Then they started coming up the back door, opening up missions on, on California coast, knowing that the country was moving west. Well, they, they got the missions all up and down California and Oregon, Cal the Catholic missions, and started working their way eastward into, <coughs> into Nevada, uh, New Mexico, and, and, uh, and Wyoming with the Catholic missions. So a mission, anybody who's been in the military will tell you the word mission is a military term. Like mission impossible, it's a military term. So Catholic missions were a military order that was uh, trying to overthrow the new republic. And so on the East Coast, it was a republic. The United States of America was a republic, and it was moving westward. Well, the Catholic Church came in through Mexico quickly and sent the military, they sent the Jesuits, who were a military order, into, uh, into California and all up and down the California coast, setting up military establishments like forts, like we did. We set, you know, set up forts and then move on, set up a fort and then move on. Well, that's what they did. They call them California missions. And so the missions were a political mission of the Jesuits to overthrow the United States of America. So if they can't stop them from the East Coast, at least you can work backwards. And so that's why today we have people running around, oh, aren't these beautiful missions? <laughs> Signing the pact for the Euro in, that, in, the, in, in Rome so before. That Say it again. <laughs> one of the popes. <clears throat> oh, we don't want to forget the Vatican's Knights of Malta, who helped the pope make his deception and human carnage possible, the Knights of Malta. It's a military order. The Knights of Malta is a military, sovereign military order of Malta. And there's a, the Knights of Malta cross. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So, um, <laughs> um, the Maltese Cross. His British wearing the Maltese Cross. This guy looks like he really thinks of himself as really important. <laughs> and here's Queen Mum probably one of the biggest criminals the world has ever allowed to be on the earth. One of the biggest criminals that's ever lived. 
the Queen Mum of England. And here's uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. He's wearing the Maltese cross too, German. <coughs> There's Cardinal Pacelli with uh, Kaiser Wilhelm behind him, the cardinal who became Pope Pius XII. There he is with uh, the Kaiser and the Germans. So the military wears the Knights of Malta. Well, uh, General Reinhard Galen. This is a very interesting man in the middle, General Reinhard Galen. Reinhard Galen was chief of security for Adolf Hitler on the Eastern Front. So he was chief of security for the Nazi party uh, between Germany and Russia. So he was in charge of all security uh, for Germany facing Russia. Reinhard Galen was knighted by the Pope, became known as a, as a Knights of the Order of Malta. And Reinhard Galen, with uh, four other men in America, um, never can remember their names, but there's like four or five men that founded an organization in America, and they were all members of the Knights of Malta. And they founded a, an organization during the war called the OSS, Office of Strategic Services. The OSS was founded in America by Reinhard Galen, Knights of Malta, uh, Nazi, and while Bill Donovan, Bill Donovan, uh, Bill Casey, Casey, Donovan, Reinhard Galen, two or three other men. It's all, it's all this is a history. Anybody can read it in a history book. But all five of these men founded uh, an organization, a secret organization, a military organization for the Knights of Malta in America. It was called the OSS. Then after the Second World War, OSS became known as CIA. The CIA was founded by Reinhard Galen, servant of uh, Adolf Hitler, and, uh, G and Casey, Wild Bill Donovan, all these guys were Catholic Knights of Malta who give us today the CIA and Homeland Security. This whole thing really stinks of Nazism, fascism, and I'd like to see the damn Catholic Church kicked out of this country. That's what I feel. Who? Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Yeah, the black pope is the head of the, the Jesuits. Yeah, well, the Rothschilds were bankers, of course, but uh, some of the reference books that I was looking at, like, for instance, in the Encyclopedia Judica, talked about the Rothschilds were uh, commissioned by the Vatican to deal with the Vatican's money. So Rothschild was not dealing with his own money, but he was, he was handling the money for the Vatican. So that would explain why one little old Jewish man could be so powerful. It was not because he had all, uh, where would he get all that kind of money to be so powerful? No, no. He was merely handling money because he was good with figures and money and banking, and was very good with it, and had sons who were very highly intelligent, well-trained in it. So the Vatican allowed uh, the Rothschilds to manipulate their finances for them. So they were the Vatican bankers. So here's uh, the Knights of Malta with the swastika, Hitler swastika in the Knights of Malta. Keeping in mind, the Knights of Malta is a Catholic organization, and there's the Nazi cross in between. Oh, that's, that's interesting. That goes back to Holy Blood, Holy Grail. That's in France. Eight points in France, and that's a, that's a whole different story, but it's eight places in the south of France where the different Knights Templar uh, lodges and castles, uh, they call them, uh, what do they call it? Chateaus. Uh, the Knights Masonic Order of Knights Templars had eight different spots, and if you draw a connection between them, it makes a eight-pointed star. Here's the, uh, uh, here's the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the, uh, the Church of England. The Church of England wearing a Nazi Knights of Malta Catholic cross called the Maltese cross. 
Here it is again. This is a Catholic order in Europe and Spain, I think. <laughs> Want to know where you get the Ku Klux Klan from? <laughs> and here's a real fruitcake. I mean, this, <laughs> this guy is a real fruit loop. A big time drag queen. Just think this 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 drag queen wanted to be president of the United States. Yeah, that's him. You know, this picture alone would tell you how really decadent and sexually filthy, these people really, really are. Yeah. That's him. Giuliani. Giuliani's dressing like a woman, dancing in the nightclub on the bottom. That's Giuliani. who didn't see anything wrong at all with 9-11, with New York, all three falling down at free fall speed into dust, didn't bother him any. Now you know why. <laughs> I swear to God, I mean, I, I, I'm just amazed what the American people take and have no idea in the world what's going on, who these people really are and what they're really doing. How much of that's chin trails and, and uh, fluoride? Say it again. Oh, Lord, yeah, that's a whole nother subject, chemtrails. 99% <laughs> of Americans look at it and say, oh, well, that, that's just a jet trail. <laughs> <sighs> Vatican Nazi Iron Cross. This is one of my favorite subjects, this one is. Here's what we call the Iron Cross, which is a symbol associated with Germany, of course. <coughs> the Iron Cross can be traced back into ancient history. The Iron Cross. Uh, it's a Masonic order, Iron Cross. Oh, I'm sorry, that was wrong. Okay, there it is. But here is the Masonic order, and uh, they're wearing the Iron Cross in red. There it is again, the Masonic Iron Cross. And here's Masters of the Universe wearing the Iron Cross. You'll see his blonde hair, blue-eyed Nazi German, German fascist Nazi Iron Cross. Arco, Iron Cross. Here's the uh, fire department, in the LA, Los Angeles Fire Department, with the Iron Cross. There's the Pope. You'll see the cross, the the uh, Iron Cross on the. Papal Tira. So I'm, I'm just telling you that you know the history of Rome and the history of Europe, and the history that's of America. There's a big story here that people have never been privy to be told. And boy, when you find out who these people really are, and how this stuff actually works, you're going to be really amazed. This was the Pentagon many years ago. <coughs> they had the Iron Cross uh, for a helicopter landing. Where the helicopters land was an Iron Cross. It's on churches. Here's Hitler, all dressed up with an Iron Cross. The British, who helped put him into power, going over the Sea of Fura. The Queen of England and the King of England has the Iron Cross over the earth. <coughs> and now, of course, we have the church today in America. The Christian church today in America. You'll see the Iron Cross over the, over the uh, mushroom uh, crown. 
the iron cross. And there's the iron cross in Nazi Germany. And um, if you're a hardcore Christian, you can buy the iron cross. It's called hardcore Christian. Yeah, believe me, when you're wearing a Nazi iron cross, you are a hardcore Christian. Boy. <laughs> You don't get any hardcore than that. There it is, hardcore Christian, iron cross of German Nazi. There it is. So does that tell you anything about the, yeah. Does that tell you anything about the church, the Christian church in America? Is there a message here? Yes. So the Catholic Church and all the other churches, all of them together, are referred to in the Bible as the whore of Babylon. These people are nothing but a bunch of whores, and they're doing business with anybody, and anything is all business. You kill, rape, murder, it's just business. Nothing personal. All the conspiracy against the human race is made possible by our fascist press, newspapers and magazines, the fascist press. So I guess that's it. I would just, yeah, thank you. So I suppose the bottom line on all of this is quite simply uh, I would suggest that each one of you begin to re-look at spirituality from a different point of view and just understand that synagogues, churches, mosques, the religious institutions in America and in the Western world, as probably for the whole world actually, but I'm more concerned about my own country, um, has nothing of any value in churches synagogues, period. There's nothing of any value in any of them. They're all man-made corporations. They've all played the whore with the church, with government, with the religious, political, military, industrial complex. It's one big, huge whorehouse of money, corruption, and politics. And I believe that there is a profound presence in the world that we call God whatever God is, but I am totally sure that God, there is one. And whatever there is, it's, it's going to deal with the human race. And people know that there's some serious problems coming, but they have no idea in the world how serious it's really going to be. Because when you get these kind of people running the U.S. government and running governments around the world that don't mind sawing children's heads off and killing you and throwing you into prison, uh, when you have no laws to protect you, we as human beings on this earth are in serious trouble. You have no idea in the world how serious this trouble that's coming really is. So I would suggest, and I've had people tell me, well, what, what can you advise us, you know, uh, you should give us something of hope. No, the only hope, the only, uh, the, as far as I'm concerned, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah. so the only thing I would suggest that I know works, and this is very, very important, and I think you should listen to this and try it. Just understand that you are a biological battery. You are a, bi a biological electrical unit, like a radio or a television, and you can receive waves from from somewhere else. You can receive spiritual uh, knowledge. I would suggest each one of you find a place where there's nobody around and sit and talk audibly with the spirit world. It's called prayer, but I'm not talking about this, the nonsense that these, these people are pushing for prayer because there's a very big difference in, but, uh, in, in I should explain to you this. Faith, the very word faith is misunderstood in the Christian and Western world. 
Faith is not what you think it is. The very word faith is a word that uh, means, uh, and the only way I can describe it is that when you get up in the morning, you put your feet on the floor and you didn't look on the floor to see if there was a floor there. But you just got up and put your feet on the floor, not even thinking about it. Why didn't you check to see if there was a floor there? <laughs> it just has always been there. Obviously it's there, and so why would you make a big to do over looking for a floor if you know it's there? That's what faith is. That's what faith means. To do something and just, ex just assume that God will be there. And every time it is there. The divine spirit in the universe is always there. It's just you that's been out. But the divine spirit is always there. And so seek and you will find. Ask and you will receive. We, you have not. The Bible has the Jesus saying you have not because you ask not. And the whole world is, is, is looking for spirituality. It's right there in you. All you got to do is talk to the spirit. So just find a place quiet and sit down and talk audibly. It has to be audible. The spirit world has to hear you. Something about that, I don't know how it works, but the spirit world, or whatever you want to call God, wants to hear it. So you talk audibly to the spirit and ask the spirit to protect you, to guide you, to make sure you meet the right person, make sure you hear the right thing, make sure you don't get in trouble and show me what I'm supposed to do, protect me. Whatever is to happen in the city, protect me, show me what I have to do, show me what I'm supposed to learn, and I will do it, and protect me. Talk. Because what you don't know is there is an intelligence watching you right now. You just didn't know it. I mean, we know that the government's watching us, and they're very silent. God is watching you, too. The Spirit of God is watching each one of us. You just didn't know it. And it's watching to see what you're going to do with your life. And it's kind of like it doesn't intervene necessarily in your life. Just, just watch what that person's doing. And if they don't want spiritual direction and protection, well, you have not because you ask not. Ask and you will receive. So I would suggest that each one of you talk to the Spirit, ask the Spirit to protect you, to guide you, to make sure you learn what you're supposed to learn, know what you're supposed to know, and uh, then, and then, most important, ask the Spirit to show me that you are hearing me. Give me a sign that you're hearing me and I'm not talking to myself. So show me a sign that you're hearing, that you're here with me and you're hearing me. Show me something so I will know that you're hearing me. Watch what happens. Because if scary things start happening around you, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and there's some kind of a glowing figure there by your bed or something like that happens to you and it scares the pee wads out of you, well, you dead ass, didn't you? You said, show me. And I'm telling you, the spirit will do something to get your attention and it will be scary. But it will be the first time that you will actually know that there is a spirit world watching you. Because you said, show me that you're here. They will. You ask, you will receive. But then when that happens, don't be afraid because, after, because actually you're the one that asked to be shown. And they will begin to guide you and you all of a sudden will meet the right person. You will find the things that you really need will just pop in on you out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, your life will start smoothing out. And because why? Because for the first time, you're not being arrogant, self-centered, egotistical, know-it-all, but be humble and ask the Spirit, show me what I'm supposed to do, and I'll do it. Protect me and show me where I'm supposed to meet, who I'm supposed to meet, what I'm supposed to learn. Show me and I will do it. And then show me that you're hearing me and watch what happens. That's spirituality. This is corporate government. Well, thank you. Thank you. Don't forget.
priesthood of the Elise. <laughs> now, friend Paul Tice, in 1994, were up in um, Mesquite, Nevada at a, a conference, and I was speaking up at that conference in Mesquite, Nevada, 1994 in December. And um, we had an incredible experience, Ivy, myself, and uh, Paul Tice, my, um, no, I'm going to stand for this. Okay. But Ivy and I were in a car with my friend Paul Tice, and we, had an, and we went up to uh, Area 51. I had never been there before, and, and Paul, my publisher friend, had not, and Ivy hadn't. So we drove up to Area 51, or Rachel, Nevada. And Jordan at, uh, yeah. Jordan at uh, 7 o'clock in the evening says, let's go up to Rachel, Nevada, and go visit uh, Pat and Joe Travis. And yeah. Go up to the Little Alien Inn. Yeah. This is December 4th. It's very cold out and snowing. So we did. Yeah, so we, we go up there to, have, have any of you heard of Area 51? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, a lot of people haven't. But... Um, you don't go into the base, but you can go to the little little town outside of the base called Rachel, Nevada. And so I asked uh, uh, Joe and Pat, the owners of the restaurant, uh, when, it, when they were closing, about 11 o'clock at night they're closing, so I said, where do we go to see UFOs? And Joe said, well, you don't have to go anywhere, just go sit in the parking lot. If they want to show, they'll, they'll pop in. And so I said, well, where did the tourists go? And, uh, and uh, Pat, his wife, said, well, go out on the highway and go back toward, go south and go back toward Las Vegas, exactly 20 miles. And exactly 20 miles, you will see a, a uh, post box, uh, a black, the black, the the black mailbox. Black mailbox. Yeah. And it's right there on the road, parked there, because that's where everybody sees things out there at that post, at, at, the, at the 20 mile mark. So we get in the car and we're driving out and I turn left and go north <laughs> instead of south. And we go out 20 miles north yeah, about 30 miles. We're looking for yeah. mile marker 29. Yeah, and we couldn't find it until finally, I think it was Ivy that said, wait a minute, we're going north, and no. she said to go south. No, no, we first of all came, we were looking for the dirt road. Yeah. Now, we're, I don't know what kind of a car we had, so we were looking for a dirt road. There's snow out on there. It's pitch black, you know, and so we find this dirt road, so we took a right. Yeah, and we drove, and Ivy said, let's go, Ivy and Paul, and remember, you said, let's go out into the desert. Let's drive out there. And I said, we're in the desert. I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> and, and, and it was extremely overcast from, from, from horizon to horizon, was totally overcast. And so I said to them, I said, what are we going to see out there? It's overcast anyway. I'm not going out in the desert, you know. I'm staying on the road. And so they insisted we go out there for a little bit. So I drove off into the, 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 the dirt road. And uh, maybe a couple of blocks in, uh, a couple of miles in, whatever it was, a couple of miles down the road. I was shaking because I did I didn't know what was going to happen because we're you know we're just in a regular car out on the desert, and uh, I finally had a point where I stopped and I said I don't like what what we're doing here I want to get out of here, and I backed the car up, to to take off and then Ivy and Paul insisted we stop for a couple of moments and at least get out. Well, it's totally overcast. So I don't know if you've ever been on a desert when it's totally overcast, but there is no light, period. So when you get out and shut the car, the car lights off, you can't see anything. It's totally black. But in a totally black environment, even the slight light you will see quickly. And so while we're standing out there talking, and all I could hear was voices, I can't see anything, uh, Ivy and Paul said, look, does the clouds are opening up, and a little bit of an opening, the clouds began to open just north of us, and in came two beautiful uh, glowing, bluish-white glowing disc-shaped things, uh, about the size that the full moon uh, appears in the sky, full moon size, two of them, glowing, beautiful, bluish-white, and as they came in, they weren't flying, but when the clouds opened up, they kind of floated in. And as they floated in, their light, the, the light emanating off of them was you know, reflecting off the clouds above them. Five more came in behind them. Five more came Seven. in behind them in formation. In formation. And I, I was absolutely frightened. 
because I, I've, I've, I've grown up in a, in a Navy city in, in Florida, and I know what the Navy has. I know what the Air Force has. I have never seen anything like this and what they were able to do. So I wanted to get out immediately. And I told Ivy, I don't know who this is, and I don't want to know. I want to get out of here. And Ivy and Paul was like they were seeing Santa Claus for the first time. They loved it. <laughs> they thought it was beautiful. And I said, it is beautiful. I want to get out of here. The men were so scared, they wrote their names in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we, uh, we, we, uh, I, we got in the car, and as we took off, I'll, Ivy and Paul went, went ballistic and started yelling. And well, before that happened, we watched them do these maneuvers. And no aircraft that we know today could do this, the kind of maneuvers that we saw them doing. They were doing right, left, forward, back, up, down. I mean, just crazy stuff. And Jordan goes, if we can see them, they can see us. <laughs> yeah. We do not want to be lunch. So Jordan got in the car, drove with the lights off like a bat out of hell, <laughs> down the road, and I said, they're following us. I said, yeah. That's the thing to say. You went faster. <laughs> then I had to flip on the lights because I knew the road was straight. But it, when you're in a car and it's total black, you only got a few, a few feet before you know you better flip on the lights. And when I flipped on the lights, I put my foot to the floor and I was speeding back to the highway and at the, all this time, Ivy and and Paul have their heads out the window, looking up, watching what's going on. I'm not watching. I don't, I don't care to see what's going on. <clears throat> and we hit the highway, and I had to slow down before I didn't want to overshoot the highway. When we, got, and we hit the highway, for some reason, all three of us felt secure again. And, and, yeah, but we got out. That road definitely could feel the presence. We were, we, yeah, we were frightened. But all the emotions that a human can have it was tears, it was beautiful, it was frightening, it was wonderful, it was all kinds of strange emotions because of what we saw out there on the desert that night was ex so extraordinary. Seven brilliantly lit uh, bluish white disc uh, in formation making no sound and were able to do uh, maneuvers that would just blow your mind to watch them. So, and then we had an experience where... Well, we got back to the Little Alien Inn and they'd given us a, a trailer, a mobile home. Yeah, mobile home. Two-bedroom yeah. mobile home. There was two beds in one room, a bed in the other room. Paul took the one, Jordan and I took the other, separate beds. We went to sleep that night. We got up the next day. And I went into the little dining uh, room there and was talking to this miner. And I told him where we were. And he said, well, you weren't in, uh, at the black mailbox you were, you were in something called oh. Railroad Valley. It yeah. was the flight approach path for Area 51, a very restricted area, super restricted area. So Jordan comes wandering in and he goes, were you up wandering around all that night last night? And I said, no. He says, wasn't that you that heard the sounds? It wasn't Paul. No, it was Paul. Paul, heard, Paul asked us. He yeah. came in and asked us if we were up walking around. And we said, no. And then he shared with us what happened to him. There was a square light on the ceiling, like in most of the houses here. And he said when he looked up at it, he saw an alien face. So he sat up, and it was like right down in his face. And he said when he sat up, it would retreat. And when he laid back down, it would come back down. And he said and the light started spinning. Uh, the room started spinning with light. And he said what he felt was is this being was uh, taking information out of his head. And... Um, so we shared our story with everybody, and we decided to, to leave the next day thinking we didn't know. I couldn't get up that night, and I had a bit of blood coming out of my nose that was on the pillow. I couldn't move at one point, so I just went back to sleep. And the next day we decided we're going to go to the black mailbox. We're going to get to this black mailbox and see this thing. It's 12 o'clock in the middle of the day, crystal clear skies. Not a sound in the sky, not anything on the road, no cars. We had no audio, no cameras, no video, nothing with us at all, which we always have. And all of a sudden, I looked over against the mountain, I go, look, there was a black octagonal cigar-shaped object with two, two Tomcat fighters escorting it. And then the sky broke loose like you wouldn't believe. From behind this mountain, an SR-71 straight up in the sky, four or five, six different kinds of jets 
flew everywhere. It's like the sky exploded with all these different kinds of aircraft and we're just standing there going, oh my God, you, you had nothing, no pictures, no nothing. I mean, these things were going everywhere, all different kinds of aircraft. And, and they filled the skies until these two Tomcats escorted this thing across the valley floor and all the way to the other side. And then we heard this thing, but you couldn't see it. Remember that, Jordan? Yeah, you could yeah. hear it, but you couldn't see it. Some giant craft, I mean, it was huge. Whatever it was, it was huge, but you couldn't see it. Then everything was gone, and it was perfectly silent. This lasted about 10 minutes, and we all looked at each other and said, did we really see that? Did that really happen? That's our experience at Area 51. Yeah. There's a lot of legitimately scary stuff going on up at Area 51. It's just my personal opinion. I'm totally convinced myself that there is extraterrestrial presence up there from what I have seen and experienced in my own. So uh, I think that is, explains a lot about what's going on on the Earth. I think we have people here, and I think Hollywood's been telling us that for a long time, that we're not alone on this planet. Somebody else is here, and they're highly intelligent and very powerful, and they're not human, and they don't care about humans. Couldn't care less. They have their own agenda. So let's, uh, let's get started with this. Uh, And um, and so I assumed that I was finished. I've had everything I own in this world stolen three times. Uh, my office was robbed and everything was gone three different times. Uh, this last time, the fourth time, I thought I had lost everything. My webmaster came in and took everything I own and tra uh, trademarked my name behind my back went to the Federal Trade and uh, trademarked my name, copyrighted my, my materials, uh, stole my website and stole everything from me to leave me for dead. And so I was totally out of commission until I met my young friend Joe. And so I wanted to introduce you to the family that I am now a part of who has saved my work and my person and allowed me to be here today. They went out of their way to take me in help me and give me a place to live and to help me to do my work. And so I just wanted to introduce you to my family. Joe, his wife. So we're going to try and do some big things now that I finally got my life back and my work back and everything's been given back to me. And my partner is Joe, uh, my young friend here. Joe is my business partner. And thank God I found him or he found me and the Spirit brought us together. So this is my new family. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought I was a goner, but uh, the Spirit finds a way to revive my work each time. It's a very difficult coming home and finding everything in your house and everything in your office gone just gone. And I've had that happen three times. I don't want that to ever happen anymore. Anyway, 